So now that we have the holly put back together, we can take the Edelbrock off of the engine. I will take a throttle cable measurement to try to match the length pretty closely with the new setup, but then everything else is pretty straightforward and it comes right back apart. We remove the fuel and the vacuum hoses, the throttle cable linkage and the return spring bracket, the choke wire, and then the whole thing lifts right back off. And in its place, we drop in the other carburetor. Then we have this special little throttle return spring bracket. Honestly, I took one look at the available space on this carburetor and I didn't feel like trying to make one. So I got this one for $10 and as an added bonus, it has dual throttle springs, which is great for safety reasons. The choke wire, I'm just going to tape up and tuck in for now as this carburetor does not have a choke. So the last thing we need on this carburetor is a fuel line. I ordered one, but DHL took it for a bit of a joy ride. And about 10 days after ordering that one, I got tired and ordered another one. This one was used and then of course, everything worked out. So I got them both on the same day. But after all that drama, at least I finally have the fuel lines in front of me. You'll notice that the bottom line is for 4150 so the fittings are a little bit farther apart to accommodate for that second metering block. This is for a 4160 with only one metering block and the plate in the back. So this one is actually the right length for this application, but we're going to use this one. First, we'll talk about why, and then we'll go through how. So I ordered both of these and they seem pretty similar, except in the pictures I could see that this had a screw-in fitting. I didn't know they were different lengths at the time, nor that this actually had a gauge adapter, which is a nice feature. So it's too bad that these are too close together for this application. But I don't have a gauge for it right now anyway, so why not just use this one? Well, I'll try to show you, but it's going to be a little hard to see. By looking down the input side, you can see how the pipes connect, and you can see how much actual space there is for gas to flow. This definitely would work, and since the needle and seat presents a smaller orifice than this anyway, I'm not too sure how important it is, but I sure don't like how small those passages end up being. On this one, it's easy to see that the flow is almost entirely open. It's still not necessarily optimized or smooth, but it's completely open to flow. So I feel much safer using this line as opposed to the other one with the more narrow openings. So for now, this one is going in the parts bin. But what are we going to do about the spacing between these fittings? I've seen some people get creative with line bending. You can lengthen everything and kind of sort of get it working. So what I'm going to do instead is cut this thing, maybe here and here, and flare the ends. Hopefully I can flare it if this tubing isn't too thick. And then clamp on a piece of rubber hose. Besides being length adjustable, the added benefit there is that the fuel bowls can be removed without unhooking the fuel lines. So that's a nice extra. And this costs a whole lot less than any of the fancy flexible line models. So we'll use this tube flaring kit and the 3 8 sized slot. Since the tubing's on the thick side, we're just gonna go for a real simple flare. My past experience with this tool tells me that with this kind of tubing, it's going to be hard to get a good flare without it sliding through. But since it's just going on a rubber hose and it only needs to hold maybe like eight PSI, we can just give it a little flare and I think it will be totally fine. And there you have it. That should be an adequate flare for our purposes. So we'll file it nice and smooth to make it easier to get the hose on and we should be good to go. Once we've cleaned everything up and made sure there's no metal chips left on any of the parts, we can go ahead and reinstall the 3 8 inch barb fitting and the 8 inch NPT plug with thread sealer on both. And now we can thread in each of our pieces of tubing. And then we can cut a piece of fuel hose that is the appropriate length. And then let's get hose clamps on this and clamp it down. A little bit of WD-40 will help us get this over the flares a little bit more easily. Let's tighten down the flare nuts. Click! Okay, they're both nice and tight and reasonably straight. So we'll even out the hose and tighten up the hose clamps. I think this fuel line is ready to go and just needs to be hooked up to the main line. But I don't really like this. And 
Now that the fuel line is set up, it's time to connect the rest of the things the carburetor needs. This vacuum hose is for the power valve, which connects straight into the intake manifold. The brake booster is hooked up to the rear 3 8 inch vacuum port. The ported vacuum port on the metering block is plugged, as is the smaller port on the base of the carburetor. I got some 3 8 inch barb fittings that fit into the 8th inch NPT fitting at the top of the blower. That way, we can hook up the PCV there. I cut an air cleaner stud out of some all thread that is the right length for the holly. I'll deal with the scoop and the rest of that setup later on. This is fine for now. And then I hooked up the throttle cable and tightened down the rest of the hardware for the return springs. The return spring bracket actually interferes with the throttle cable when it's at wide open throttle and the cable can get jammed up. And we obviously don't want that. I took the bolt back out for the return spring bracket. I flipped the springs so they're attached on the inside of the throttle arm. So at least we won't have to worry about that anymore. So with the fuel line installed and everything hooked up, we're ready to give this another go. was a little hesitant at first and it wouldn't keep running without my foot on the throttle. So for now, I turned in the throttle screw, started it back up, and it ran all on its own. This wasn't exactly a low idle, but the exhaust temperature still seemed at least as high as before, if not actually a little higher. So I decided I should give it all the timing I possibly can. First off, I changed the stop screw in the distributor to limit the mechanical advance to 10 degrees instead of 16. This way I can set it to 18 degrees of initial but still only have 28 total. Next, I elected to figure out what I wanted to do with the vacuum advance. I hadn't planned on setting this up right away, but I really want to throw all the timing I can at this thing to keep down those exhaust temperatures. So we might as well sort this out right now. The issue with using it as it is set up is it's pulling in over 16 degrees. We want to limit the vacuum advance to around 10 degrees. This is an adjustable unit, but that adjustment is for the rate at which the advance comes in. It does not limit the total advance. On this unit, there's no built-in way to adjust that. So much like the mechanical advance stop screw, we need to make an advance stop for the vacuum can. By cutting out this piece of steel to fit over the vacuum advance canister mounting screws and drilling a precisely sized hole for the advance pull-down lever, we can control exactly how much it's allowed to move. This took a couple of iterations and a bit of trial and error, but I eventually figured out that a 1964th drill bit drills the perfect sized hole to get 10 degrees of vacuum advance out of this unit. I hooked up this aftermarket tack underneath the hood to help me tune everything. That way I can finally see the actual engine RPM. I noticed that even with the strongest springs I have, the mechanical advance was still coming in too fast. It was all in around 1700 RPM. So just on a whim, while I had the distributor part, I wondered if I could lighten the weights by drilling holes in them to make the advance come in a bit later. This didn't end up having any noticeable effect, but I might look into this a bit more later or try to figure out where I can get some very heavy springs. I'd like to have the mechanical advance all in between 2 and 2500 RPM, but it probably won't make a big difference for this setup anyway. So even with all the timing, the exhaust was still around 800 degrees, so I needed to get the idle speed under control as well as the idle mix. It was running rich enough to burn your eyes just being in the vicinity of it. I could turn the idle mixture screws all the way in with no effect. That means the throttle is too far open. I closed the throttle just about all the way and the idle speed screws still weren't doing a whole lot. So I needed to adjust the position of the secondary throttle blades. You adjust this on a holly by turning a small screw underneath the carburetor to adjust the opening of the secondary throttle blades. I ground down a 3 16 inch screwdriver bit to fit, but it was really stuck. So I had to actually take the carburetor off and flip it over and use a wrench to turn the thing to unstick it. And with the carburetor upside down like that, I set the transition slots by eye, put it back on, and it still wasn't great. I just needed to mess around with the opening of the primary and secondary blades for a while before I got something pretty good sorted out. The idle mixture screws now have an effect, but I'm running with them about three quarters of a turn out, which is still a bit far in for how rich it actually is, so it needs more fine tuning, but it's running fairly well for now. After a whole lot of tuning and tweaking pretty much everything, I ended up with an idle in park between 8 and 900 RPM 
and an idle and drive of 650 RPM. I set the timing at 17 degrees initial for 27 degrees total with an additional 10 degrees of vacuum advance on top of that. With all this extra timing, as well as the idle speed and mixture adjustments, the exhaust is down to a much more reasonable temperature. It's still a bit on the hot side, but probably for the reasons we discussed in the previous video. Reading the temperature between the tubes with an infrared thermometer isn't the most accurate thing, but after almost half an hour of idling in the garage, all of the tubes read between 450 and 580 degrees. But, as discussed in a previous episode, the issue with having the idle this low is that the blower is going to rattle. Since the coupler fits loosely in the splines, all the engine vibration is transmitted through that drive belt, and when it's in gear, you sure hear it. In park or neutral, the noise is gone. But when it's in gear and it drops to 650 RPM, the rattle from the blower, even with the hood closed, is pretty significant. I talked to the blower shop on the phone, and while the guy was very nice and forthcoming, unfortunately, he couldn't really tell me anything about this that I didn't already know. I hit Google and read a lot of forum posts about superchargers, and in particular, these small Y-end superchargers. I found at least a dozen people talking about the rattle these things have at idle. It seems to be a very common complaint. I even found some saying they had the blower rebuilt and it came back with the exact same rattle. I suspect certain engine combinations, especially ones with high idles, would probably never hear this noise, so it would only really come up with a mild camshaft and a low idle like this engine has. So now I at least feel confident that this noise is normal, and while it is annoying, it should not cause any damage. I had someone in the comments call me out on how I installed this transmission oil cooler. And they're completely right, I installed this wrong. I would seen other comments and seen on forums elsewhere that you can bypass the transmission oil cooler and the radiator completely and just run an auxiliary cooler. What I didn't realize is what they meant was a plate and fin cooler, which is a completely different system than what this car has. This has a tiny little tube and fin cooler, and these are only meant for auxiliary use. So it would keep a cooler than nothing, but not nearly as cool as a proper air cooler or the liquid to liquid cooler in the radiator. So instead of bypassing the radiator completely like I had done, which I would not recommend, an auxiliary cooler like this should be plumbed in after the cooler in the radiator. So we want the fluid to come out of the transmission, through the radiator cooler, then through the auxiliary cooler, and then back to the transmission. On a turbo 350 transmission like this is, the lower line is the feed. The transmission cooler I bought for the Blazer, which I still haven't installed, came with this fitting, which would work, but I'd rather not have the hose coming all the way around the radiator like this. So for our setup, I'm gonna take some 5 16 steel line and have it come out of the top there and bend around, and the hose won't be making any sharp bends. I think this will be the best way to connect everything together. And we'll steal this fitting off of the busted up line that was installed on the radiator previously. So it took some 5 16 steel tubing so we'll place the fitting on the tube and flare one end for the radiator and just put a little bit of a barb on the other end for the hose to clamp onto. So here we are, here's our neat little fitting. So then we remove the lower hose from the line, connect that line to the radiator, connect the hose to the line we made, and connect our line to the top of the radiator. Once everything is tight, our transmission oil cooler is connected properly and ready to keep everything cool. So I started up the engine to check for leaks. And what I found wasn't so much a leak as it was a fountain. There is right there. I guess this thing was bent and unbent too many times. I guess when I bent it to get it hooked back up, it was too much for the poor little guy. So what I'm going to do is take this fitting back out and cut the line somewhere behind there and flare that and then just put a piece of hose connecting onto this guy. So 
but I was actually ready to take the blame on this one for maybe bending it too many times or kinking it in some funny way. But what actually happened is it had been rubbing. If I had to guess, it was probably rubbing against the idler arm. So it ended up with a thin spot. And when I was bending it to line things up, that's where it cracked. So I'd say that's actually a good thing because I would much rather it crack when I'm ready and looking for the problem than have it crack just from vibration going down the road. If you look real close, you can see there's actually some rust on this part that's been worn away. Just a little tiny bit of rust there. So this was not a recent issue. Not the prettiest, it ended up a little off center there. But as far as holding the hose on, this bar will do just fine. I was doing some testing to see how easily this steel line would accept a double flare like this. So this is actually going to be the perfect length and the perfect piece for our new little fitting. So I'll take the damaged piece of line, cut the fitting off of it, and then use a short piece of transmission cooler hose to connect the two lines. That should take care of this problem. I'll just have to make sure the hose is routed away from anything that might rub through it. And after replacing that line, I topped off the transmission fluid and made sure there was nothing else leaking. Now that the temperatures seem to be under control and everything appears to be running well, there's only one thing left to do. Actually drive the car. Got it out on the road and put it through its paces. The engine sounds good. The cooling system and the radiator fans seem to be working perfectly. The supercharger's rattle disappears off idle and is replaced by the whine of the gears. It's pretty quiet below 2000 RPM, but above that you get that really classic, characteristic supercharger whine. And this thing screams. At wide open throttle, it is significantly louder than before. There's some funny noises and rattles that I'm just gonna have to take time to try to sort out, but I didn't hear any pinging. I'm gonna have to look at the spark plugs really closely and just keep fiddling with this thing to try to figure out what it likes the best. The transmission kickdown cable still isn't connected, so I was driving it around in second gear at 40 to 70 miles per hour to get the engine into a high RPM range and see how it does. It's definitely faster than before, and once it starts building boost, it wants to go. People used to something really fast would probably still call it slow, but to me, especially considering it still has highway gears, it drives just like I'd hoped it would. It's going to take a while to sort out all the little quirks and get used to the driving characteristics of a supercharger, but I can't wait to spend the time with it to sort those things out. It would help if I had the keys. Oh, no, okay, yeah, this is before, before the new distributor.
76 on the primaries and 82? Pull that right on. There is definitely a torque spec for these, but I do not remember what it is. Oh, this thing's gonna be a pain in the ass, isn't it? <laughs>